Got another question here on the year 13 rates of reaction topic. So this is number two. As always, the link to the questions in the description of the video. So if you want to try the question first and then play on for the answers. Okay, so the first thing we've got to do is establish the order of reaction for the three reactants that we've got. So iodine we're going to get from the graph and obviously the propanone and the HCl we'll get from the table. So while the graph's there on the screen, we'll just talk about that. You can see that the initial rate is constant. It's just flatlining across there. But the concentration of iodine is changing. It's increasing as we go left to right. So obviously the change in concentration of iodine has no effect on the rate. And so it's zero order with respect to I2. So there's that written up there. So if we move on to the table now to get the orders with respect to propanone and HCl. So we'll start with um, propanone. So we need to hold the HCl concentration constant if we can, and we can in experiments one and two. So if we have a look at how the propanone's changing, it's gone from that to that, so it's doubled. What's happened to the rate? It's doubled as well. So it must be first order with respect to propanone. So I would always get my students to just write it up very simply like this, but be very, very clear about how you've established your order. So quote which experiments you've used, say what's happened to the concentration of the thing that's changed, say what's happened to the rate, and then put your order in. You don't have to write a paragraph, literally that line does everything you need. So moving on to the HCl, you can see that in experiments two and three, we can keep the propanone concentration constant. So what's happening to the concentration of HCl? It's gone from that to that. So it's gone up by a factor of 2.5. Not as straightforward to see what's happening there. So all you need to do there is put the bigger number over the smaller number to see how many times bigger this is. And you'll find that that's also a 2.5 increase. And so therefore it's first order again with respect to HCl this time. Okay, so moving on to the rate constant now. So from the orders, we can write the rate equation. So it's going to look like that. The I2 doesn't feature in the rate equation because it's zero order with respect to iodine. So there's your rate equation. Obviously rearrange for K because we'll need to find a value for the rate constant. So we get this here. And then I'm just going to sub in the values for experiment one and work out K. So from those numbers, you get a value of K at 7 times 10 to the minus 5. Now, it doesn't matter which experiment you use because you should still get the same answer for K. Now, obviously, we need to work out the units as well. So I'm just going to change the numbers there to the units. So we've got the units of rate on the top, moles per decimeter cube per second. And because we've got two lots of concentration, uh, there's no powers involved, so it's just moles per decimeter cubed times moles per decimeter cubed. And then we can cancel moles per decimeter cubed on the top with one of the ones on the bottom. And then all we do is take this up to the top and flip the signs. So there's the units there. dm cubed, mole to the minus one, seconds to the minus one. And finally, we've got to come up with a possible two-step mechanism for this reaction. So we've got the overall equation here and the rate equation there. Now the rate equation is really important because it tells us the species, the particles that react in the um, rate determinant step, which we're told is got to be the first step. Now there's often more than one way to do these things, but you must, everybody must have these in these quantities as the reactants for the rate determinant step. So the next thing to do is just look at the overall equation and ask yourself, can you make any of the products from the reactants that you've got? Well, you can't make an I2 because you don't have enough iodine. You could make one of those HCl. So let's go for that. So what's left over? An H and an I. So we'll make some hydrogen iodide. Now that doesn't feature in the overall equation. So we need to get rid of it. So it's acting as what's called an intermediate. So we'll put it in as a reactant in step two. Notice that we need another mole of ICL. We've got two moles of ICL in the overall equation, but there's only one so far. So if we bring another one of those in, so we need another HCL. And we also need to make an I2. So that works. 
So we'll just when you add these two equations together, you'll notice that the um, HIs will cancel. And you're left with H2 plus two ICLs gives two HCLs and I2. Now I'm going to show you one other way to do it, um, kind of to make the point that sometimes you have to take a bit of a leap of faith and maybe just create a substance that you've maybe never seen before. So we're going to just add everything together and make this sort of super molecule H2ICL. don't even know if that's a thing, but it would be allowed provided it all works. So it certainly balances two H's and I and a CL. Obviously that's what we've got, we've just added them together. It obviously doesn't feature in the overall equation, so we need to get rid of it. So we'll sort of make it act as an intermediate. What do we need? We'll still need another ICL. So if we rack that with ICL, and then from all of those atoms, you can actually make two moles of HCl, and you can make the I2 that you need. And obviously when you add these two equations together, this thing cancels and you're left with H2 plus two ICL gives two HCL and I2. So that is actually a valid mechanism and it would be credited.